Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a big hand to welcome our Master of Ceremony tonight, Ms. Beatrice Nava to the stage. Ms. Nava, please. Thank you very much. So, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Beatriz Nava. I'm the Consul for Cultural Promotion of the Consulate General of Mexico. And on behalf of the Consulate Generals of Mexico, the Argentine Republic, Peru, and Colombia, I would like to warmly welcome you to this seminar on Latin American literature. The Consulate Generals participating in the Latin American Pavilion of the Hong Kong Book Fair would like to express their deepest gratitude to the Hong Kong Trade Development Council and to our speakers tonight for this opportunity to highlight the unrivaled richness of the literature tradition in Spanish language in our continent before this most distinguished public. In this regard, I would like to acknowledge the presence of the Consul Generals of Mexico and Colombia, the Acting Consul General of Peru, and the Consul for Control Promotion of the Argentine Republic, as well as that of the distinguished authorities of the Hong Kong Trade Development Council. Thank you very much for being here with us tonight. Indeed, the Latin American participation at the 26th Hong Kong Book Fair is a recognition not just of the increasingly close relations between the countries of our region and China, but also of how much both societies have to learn from each other and how much of it can be learned through the power of words. In order, in order, in order to honor the theme of the 26th Hong Kong Book Fair, Reading the World, Love at First Book, the program of tonight's seminar will be divided in two parts. The first half of the session will be devoted to the seminar Latin American Writers Reading the World, Alejo Campentier and Octavio Paz, by Dr. Mercedes Vasquez, lecturer in Spanish and Hispanic Film and Literature at the School of Modern Languages and Cultures of the University of Hong Kong. Dr. Vasquez will focus on Cuban writer Alejo Carpentier's celebrated novel, The Explosion in a Cathedral, and Mexico's Octavio Paz's most famous essay, The Labyrinth of Solitude, as proposed departure points to initiate readers to the fascinating world of Latin American literature. The second part of the seminar will be followed by a reading, by a reading from the local poetry collection Desde Hong Kong, Poets in Conversation with Octavio Paz, which was published to illustrate the influence of the Mexican Nobel Prize laureate, Octavio Paz, and how his work continues to inspire across decades, cultures, and oceans. At the end of the second part, a question and answer will follow. Without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Doceres Vasquez to take the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Nava, for those kind words. Um, Consul General, representatives on the Book Fair and the Hong Kong Trade Development Council, uh, members of the general public and book lovers, thank you for being here. This is an invitation to enjoy and revisit two Latin American books. A novel by the Cuban writer Alejo Carpentier, Explosing a Cathedral, as uh, Ms. Nava has mentioned, and the collection of essays entitled The Labyrinth of Solitude by the Mexican author Octavio Paz. Inspired by this year's book fair theme, I selected these books because in them the question of knowing oneself is essentially tied to the question of looking at the world, which is so typical of nations that have experienced colonialism. As you know, Latin America is a site of encounter of three major cultural groups, Europeans, native Latin Americans or Amerindians, and Africans. These historical encounters surely resonate in a city like Hong Kong that epitomizes the encounter uh, between Asian and European cultures, the so-called East and West, and uh, a city that aspires to be, or perhaps already is, a world city. But how do the selected Latin American texts for this evening view such encounters? Let me just put the... Um, I don't want to run... Okay. Explosion in a Cathedral is a novel first published in 1962, but written a few years earlier, that deals with the penetration of the ideas of the Enlightenment and the French Revolution in Latin America, which eventually led to the explosion of independence movements across the subcontinent. It is an epic novel set a little earlier than the beginning of the independence of Haiti, 
uh, the Caribbean island in 1791 and the year 1808 when Napoleon Bonaparte invaded Spain in Europe. It is relevant for us still today because it is an example of how a writer and musicologist, Alejo Carpentier, depicts not only the influence of European ideas on colonies, but also how the colonized subjects felt about European ideas and their applicability in Latin America. The young protagonists of this novel, Esteban and Sofia, read the world with new eyes. They are initially captivated by the French ideas, but gradually and painfully realize that the French revolutionary process is full of contradictions and that ideals and a path to a better world are fraught with dangers. To survive, they need to search for their own view, their own idea of how to proceed and create a new world. The second, very different book that I invite you to read in connection with this theme of reading the world is the collection of essays, The Labyrinth of Solitude, published in 1950 and revisited many years later. Um, in these essays too, Octavio Paz often deals with what is not Mexico in order to better understand Mexicanidad, Mexicanness, the Mexican self. The meaning of death for a contemporary Mexican, for instance, and you all might have heard of the Day of the Dead, can only be understood by observing how the Mexican neighbors to the north, the Americans of the United States, deal with death. But also how ancient Mexican civilizations and the Spanish colonizers dealt with it or with other phenomena like uh, institutions of power uh, or like religious institutions or political institutions. Contrary to what this might seem, Path clarifies in his 1970 revision of the original essay that he did not intend to write a Mexican philosophy or a psychology of the Mexican, but to critically analyze Mexicanidad in a constructive manner. In fact, as he states, some of his reflections do not simply apply to Mexicans, but are universal. And for this reason, I highlighted them in this event. Both texts are relevant for Asian contemporary readers, as I hope to be able to prove. I will focus on uh, Alejo Carpentier first. This is the story of the relationship between four characters. The French Victor Hughes and two Cuban youths whose father has just passed away, Carlos and Sofia, living in a rich mansion in Havana with their orphaned cousin, Esteban. Despite my focus on historical processes here, the novel is very romantic and contains very passionate passages as well as terrible uh, scenes of prostitution and rape, particularly of female slaves or mestizos, uh, some of them children. The author said that he first thought of the idea of this novel when a minor airplane accident brought him to the island of Guadalupe in the Caribbean, the sea between the North and South America, where Carpentier first heard of a man called Victor Hughes. Despite Hughes' importance in bringing European political and philosophical ideas to Latin America, this historical figure who managed to retain the island of Guadalupe for the French and took it away from the British has remained almost unknown. The title of the book by Carpentier is very significant. The Spanish original title is El Siglo de las Luces. Its literal translation is the century or the age of enlightenment which, as you know, is a term com commonly used to refer to the illustration, the age of enlightenment that we usually study in schools through texts of philosophers and humanists of the 18th century like Diderot, Voltaire, Montesquieu and Rousseau. Their writings propose the separation of the uh, executive, legislative and judicial powers, for instance, universal suffrage, etc. When Carpentier brought the book to the publisher, he was told that uh, it, was like, it looked like a philosophy book rather than a novel, but he insisted and said um, this is what he wanted. And uh, these are his words. When I published El Siglo de las Luces, my publishers were initially shocked and said, but this title makes the book look like an essay about the 18th century. This does not look like a novel. I insisted. The book has this name because the Age of Enlightenment which has widely served as an example of rationality, of philosophical thinking, of peace and calm and whatever, is one of the bloodiest in history. Economy based on slavery, repression, punishments, sorcery, massacres of Protestants, etc. 
And the author also adds, the age of enlightenment that finishes in the novel is a long century of plenitude which transformed the world. The famous painting in the novel, Explosion in a Cathedral, is the symbol of the commotion produced by the French Revolution. I try to show that this moment when men, under the influence of Diderot, Voltaire, and Montesquieu, aspired to be rational, society was full of irrational currents and manifestations. It is the time of the black masses of slavery. This is why in the novel I have insisted in Freemasonry and witchcraft. And, end of quotes. In the novel, Esteban describes it, describes the painting, this painting that we are seeing here like this, um, well, their house is full of uh, the house where Carlo, um, yeah, Carlos Esteban and Sofia live is full of valuable furniture and objects of art. They are very rich. Among them, there is this painting of the 17th century. And Esteban, and this is how it is described within the novel, Esteban had a taste for the imaginative and the fantastic. And would they dream for hours in front of pictures by modern artists representing monsters spectral horses or impossible scenes, a tree man with fingers sprouting from him, a cupboard man with empty drawers coming out of his stomach. But his favorite painting was a huge canvas by an unknown Napolitan master which confounded all the laws of plastic art by representing the apocalyptic immobilization of a catastrophe. It was called Explosion in a Cathedral this vision of a great colonnade shattering into fragments in mid-air, pausing a moment as its lines broke, floating so as to fall better, before it dashed in tons of stone down onto the terrified people beneath. I don't know how you can look at it, his cousin used to say, though she was strangely fascinated herself in reality by the terrible suspense of this static earthquake this silent cataclysm, this illustration of the end of time, hanging there within reach of their hands. End of quotes. And this is the reason why the novel's title was translated into English as Explosion in a Cathedral. The painting is in fact a real painting made by uh, Monsu Desiderio, whose exact title is Explosion in a Church. And Carpentier chose this painting as a leitmotif for his novel without knowing that in fact, there was a painting by this painter in Cuba at the time. It is also, uh, this is one of the facts that uh, Alejo Carpentier imagined and turned out to be real, the same as the, um, some of the, the novel is very well documented, it's historically documented, he did a lot of archival research. And, uh, but the, the three characters that accompanied uh, this historical figure, Victor Hughes, uh, in the novel are fictional, they are based on real people, but they are fictional. And the girl is called, the woman is called Sophia, and end up, uh, she's uh, Victor Hugh's lover. And he gave the name of Sophia without knowing. Uh, after publishing the, the novel, he found out that uh, Victor Hughes had, in fact, had a, you know, his love had been a Cuban named Sophia. So it was a very strange coincidence. A relative of Victor Hughes, after having the novel published, contacted Alejo Carpentier and told him that uh, the events were uh, well depicted in the novel and that the woman was in fact named Sophia. So this is a very magic um, like premonition. No? And the same with the painting. When he chose this painting, it was just because it represented what he really wanted to convey. And uh, he later found out that there was another painting by this, uh, you know, it was quite unlikely, he thought, that uh, there was a painting by Dye Painter in Cuba at the time. And he later found out there is a painting and at that time, when uh, the novel is set, there was already a painting by this painter, which is incredibly interesting. Um, why was Carpentier interested in this historical period? Because he thought that the topics that interested people at the turn of the, at the, turn of the 19th century, when the novel is set, were the same as the European youth and intellectuals of the period between the two world wars. Uh, in Europe. Uh, Alejo Carpentier was living in Europe uh, the, between the two world wars. Knowledge of the Enlightenment ideas and the new forms of communication and learning that the popularization of the printing press enabled, and you know that according to Benedict Anderson, the, the role of the printing press was essential in uh, the processes of independence of Latin American countries. 
um, the printing press became very useful in a historical moment when Napoleon Bonaparte invaded Spain and the Spanish king was brought to France and was substituted by Napoleon Bonaparte's brother, Joseph Bonaparte. The Spanish population did not accept this invasion and the Spanish king, Ferdinand VII, would return to Spain to re-establish his absolute and despotic monarchy in 1814. In his colonizing and imperial campaign following the French Revolution, Napoleon had sought to create an immense empire. And uh, here we can see two paintings, um, well, I, I show you that, two paintings uh, made in 1814 by one of the greatest Spanish painters, Goya. He painted this in 1814 to commemorate the popular uprising of the Spanish population against the French. The first picture depicts the uprising of the people of Madrid against the Mamelukes, the Turkish troops um, fighting for Napoleon, and the second, the max executions against these people that the French ordered. As you can see, uh, we cannot see the faces of the French troops, uh, but uh, we do see very clearly the faces uh, of the Spanish, of the people from Madrid being slaughtered. No? Alejo Carpentier's novel is imbued with Goya's spirit particularly towards the end. And two of the characters, Sofia and Esteban, end up moving to Spain at this very particular historical moment. This is where the novel ends. According to the author, the principle that sustains the novel and that I believe is also significant for the people of Hong Kong and universally is, los hombres pueden flaquear, pero las ideas siguen su camino y encuentran al fin su aplicación. People can hesitate in their determination to carry out goals but ideas follow their path and end up being applied. He wrote a book at a time when the Cuban Revolution, Cuba is a socialist country since 1959, felt victorious, empowered. He has always been a strong supporter of the Cuban Revolution, and in fact, his characters are described in terms of their support for revolutionary processes. And uh, the, all the failings that we see about, uh, about the French Revolution sometimes have been interpreted as allegorically meaning the failure of the Cuban Revolution, but he actually wrote the novel before 1959, so the novel was already written by them. Carlos is the character who ends up following his father's trade after a brief period of enthusiasm for revolutionary ideas. Esteban is the man who has a revolutionary idea in mind, and when the real revolutionary processes become messy and contradictory, uh, and they do not fit uh, Esteban's ideal, he stops supporting the revolution. Sofia represents the person who intuitively understands the revolution and takes practical steps towards it, who works for it without questioning it too much. What happened with the French invasion in Spain is that suddenly the colonies of the vast Spanish empire had no king, and if the Spaniards did not accept the authority of the French and form juntas in Cadiz, the same started to happen in Latin America. And this was the beginning of the fight for independence in most Latin American nations. Most of them uh, became independent after between 1810 and 1820. This is how we usually study in history and culture books. So the emphasis is on how the ideas of the French Enlightenment uh, produced, you know, uh, helped independence processes. But what is great about this novel is that um, the focus is not just on how Europeans enlightened Latin Americans, but also how Latin Americans viewed those ideas and their applicability, you know, as I said. Uh, Carpentier was not only interested in showing the European ideas, how, how they had spread across Latin America and had triggered the continental independence movements, um, led by historical figures like Simón Bolívar, San Martín, Hidalgo, and Morelos. He was interested in how those ideas changed in America, how they had been adapted there. No? Um, I have selected an excerpt from the book, which, I, which you all have, uh, for you to realize this point of view, and I have also brought a clip from a field adap adaptation of the novel in which Sophia questions what the French are doing with the slaves. Uh, shall we just read uh, the excerpt together a moment? because it's very um, um, significant. Um, it's the one by Alejo Carpentier, and I'm, I'm going to start on page 319. Do you all have it? Yeah. Like a long and fearful roll of thunder in summer. Uh, this is a moment when uh, Esteban is accompanying the French uh, leader, Victor Hughes, who, who has uh, acquired a lot of political power 
in the Caribbean and is like the representative of the French government and the French Enlightenment ideas and the French Revolution in, in the Caribbean, in some of the Caribbean islands like Cayenne and uh, Guadeloupe. And Esteban, uh, the, this chapter is seen from the point of view of Esteban, the idealist who is starting to realize that um, maybe the French are just very uh, defenders of the you know, freedom, equality and all that on paper, but then in reality, the, the reality is very different. No? Like a long and fearful roll of thunder in summer, heralding cyclones that will blacken the sky and tear down cities, um, yes, the, the cruel news rang out around the Caribbean amid shouts and the lighting of torches. The law of the 30th Floreal of the year 10 had been promulgated. Slavery was reinstituted in the French colonies in America and the decree of the 16th Pluvios of the year 2 was no longer effective. There was great rejoicing amongst the landowners, ranchers and planters who were soon informed on some, of something so interesting to them. Indeed, the news traveled ahead of the ships, especially when they found that they would be reverting to the system that had prevailed in the colony previous to the 1789, which meant that they had finished with the humanitarian lucubrations of that filthy revolution once and for all. In Guadeloupe, Dominica and Marigaland, the news was greeted with salvos and illuminations, and thousands of former free citizens were led back to their old hutments once more, beneath a rain of sticks and ropes ends. The big whites of the old days set out in the countryside, into the countryside with packs of dogs at their heels to look for their former servants, who were brought back to their compounds with chains round their necks. So afraid were they that mistakes might be made during this mass manhunt that many slaves who had seen, been set free in the days of the monarchy and possessed businesses or small holdings gathered their belongings together in the hope of escaping to Paris. But their plan was promptly foiled by another decree, that of the fifth messidor, which forbade any colored individual to enter France. Bonaparte considered that there were already too many blacks in metropolitan France and feared that their excessive numbers might transmit to European blood the same tinge that spread through Spain after the Moorish invasion. Um, well, the, then they are complaining and, um, and uh, we, we can uh, just jump to page 320 um, how the slaves are trying to run away. The last paragraph on page 320 but everywhere dark shapes were already melting into the night, seeking asylum in the undergrowth and the jungle. Those who had not been caught in the first hole headed for the mountains, stealing canoes and boats to make their way upstream. They were unarmed, almost naked, but determined to return to the way of life of their ancestors, somewhere where the whites would not be able to reach them. As they passed the outlying plantations, they spread the news amongst their own people and then and 10, 20, more men would abandon their work, deserting the fields of indigo and clover, blah, blah, blah. And then the last uh, paragraph uh, depicts uh, Sophia's reaction. On the Friday, Sophia learned of what had been perpetrated the previous Tuesday and greeted the news with horror. All her hopes of what she would find here in this outpost of the new ideas were turning into intolerable disappointments. So... Um, I'm going to now show you, uh, uh, this is, these are two of the engravings of the, by, by Goya as well, that very much represent and influence the ideas of the, of the novel. In one of them we can read, El sueño de la razón produce monsters, the, the dream of reason produces monsters. No? That is a little bit the idea also behind of the, uh, how the, the reason brought, the enlightening ideas turned out to be monsters there, no? and the, the witches as well during the invasion uh, of, of Spain. And there is a, a film adaptation of the novel which I would really like to, um, to show you, just a, a short clip. It's a fantastic film adaptation by one of the uh, foremost uh, um, Cuban filmmakers. Just a moment, I might need some help. And this is the passage in which uh, um, Sophia and, uh, finally realizes that um, the, the ideas of, uh, of her uh, lover, Victor Hughes, are being just corrupted in, uh, in, in practice. Mm -hmm. we... Señora Sofía, el señor San Afril la busca. Está en la sala. Dile que voy enseguida. Sí, señora.
No quisiera molestarla, señora. Pero quiero dejarle estos libros. Son de mi propiedad y espero que le gusten. Muchas gracias. Me da usted mucho placer. Siéntese. Es un placer encontrar a alguien tan refinado en este país de bárbaros. Sí. Sobre todo una mujer como usted. ¿Sabe que ahora la encuentro aún más hermosa que hace un año? También ha cambiado mucho en un año la Guyana. Es como medio siglo atrás. Desgraciadamente. Proclamación de la ley del 30 Florial del año 10. En virtud de esta ley, se anula lo dispuesto por el decreto del 16 pluvioso del año 2. Se abolía la esclavitud en las colonias de América. Por consiguiente, los ciudadanos que han sido liberados volverán a su condición de esclavos. ¡Qué desastre! Por consiguiente, los ciudadanos... ¡Silencio! Por consiguiente, los ciudadanos liberados volverán a su condición de esclavos Volverán a sus amos respectivos y regresarán a los dominios de sus propietarios legítimos. Propietarios legítimos. Los esclavos que, que han sido sentenciados serán fusilados. Y aquellos que intenten evadir los rigores de la ley serán castigados con extrema severidad por un decreto anexo del cinco mesidor. A todo individuo de color le será prohibida la entrada al territorio de Francia metropolitana. A menos que vaya acompañando a su amo o amo. Bonaparte cónsul. Bonaparte cónsul. Termine con esto, San África. A sus órdenes. Silencio. Nos llevarán a la herrería. Allá les van a poner los billetes. Mañana por la mañana vendrán sus dueños para recogerlos. Les recuerdo que tenemos órdenes de matar a todos aquellos que intenten fugarse. ¡Arriba, arriba! ¡Andando! ¡Muévanse! ¡Llévense todo esto! ¡Muévanse! ¡Muevan el culo! ¡Vamos! ¿Qué pasa? ¡Rápido! ¡Vamos, avancen! ¡Avancen! Antes de venir hacia aquí... Esperaba encontrarme con hombres capaces de dirigir el mundo que les pertenecía sin concesiones. Ya que hasta esto, al restablecimiento gradual de todo cuanto parecía bonito. Cálmate. Tú venciste Inglaterra en la Guadalupe. No vacilaste ni un solo instante ante el restablecimiento de una guerra entre Francia y los Estados Unidos. Desplegaste una energía brutal, casi sobrehumana, para la abolición de la esclavitud hace ocho años. Y ahora tú, el mismo hombre, utiliza esa energía para restablecerla. Según tú... Soy yo quien decide los decretos. No. Yo más bien creo que tú has renunciado a esta revolución. Fue Bonaparte el que dijo que terminamos la novela de la revolución. Lo que nos toca ahora es considerar solo lo que es real y posible en la aplicación de sus principios y comenzar su historia. Sofía, si el restablecimiento de la esclavitud es una necesidad política, yo lo siento. Pero debo inclinarme ante ella. Soy un político. ¡Político de mierda! ¡Protéjanse! ¡Agárrense la otra vía! ¡Una patrulla a tierra para rodearlo! Turn to the second reading that I recommend this evening. Um, as I said, Goya and, and this particular uh, painting by Goya um, that I just mentioned um, also appears in the Labyrinth of Solitude. Path did not try to write the psychology of the Mexican, as I mentioned in the introduction, 
um, nor did he believe that the Mexican was an essence which could be uh, described. Um, in his words, uh, in his own words, um, this is how he say, what are we and how can we fulfill our obligations to ourselves as we are? The answers different, differ in different situations and the national character which has thought to be immutable changes with them. To become aware of our history is to become aware of our singularity. It is a moment of reflective repose before we devote ourselves to action again. For him, the Mexican is a history, a relationship. As he put it, I repeat that we are nothing uh, except a relationship, something that can be defined only as a part of a history. The question of Mexico is inseparable from the question of Latin America's future, and this in turn uh, is included in another, that of the future relations between Latin America and the United States. The questions of ourselves always turns out to be a question of others. And I, the excerpt I have uh, left uh, with you is, uh, extends on this. Is part, this. This is part of the paper that I left there, but we don't have time to, to read it, so I just carry on. The title of the cohesive, cohesive collection of essays published in 1950 is the literal translation of the Spanish title, El Laberinto de la Soledad. The word solitude, soledad, probably reminds you of another very important writer, Gabriel García Márquez and his 100 years of solitude. Although uh, in the Colombian uh, author's uh, novel, this is from the outset, solitude from the outset uh, is uh, an allegory of, or refers to the whole continent, whereas uh, in the, the term solitude in uh, the labyrinth of solitude is initially cir circumscribed to the Mexicans. The first essay is about a figure called the Pachuco. The Pachucos are mostly uh, Chicano youths of Mexican origin living in the southern cities of the United States. Um, in the 40s and 50s, when this book was written, uh, they formed gangs uh, and were easily identified by the clothes they wore and the way, the way they spoke. As Path put it, these are instinctive rebels, and North American racism has vented its wrath on them more than once. But the Pachucos do not attempt to indicate the race or the rationality of their forebears. Their attitude reveals an obstinate, almost fanatical will to be. But this will affirms nothing specific except their determination. The Pachuco does not want to become a Mexican again. At the same time, he does not want to blend into the life of North America. And he adds, our profound sense of solitude alternatively affirms and denies itself in melancholy and rejoicing. Silence and sheer noise, gratuitous crimes and religious fervor. Man is alone everywhere, but the solitude of the Mexican under the greatest tongue night of the high plateau that is still inhabited by insatiable gods is very different from that of the North American, who wanders in an abstract world of machines, fellow citizens, and moral precepts. And he adds, the history of Mexico is the history of a man seeking his parentage, his origins, he has been influenced at one time or another by France, Spain, the United States, and the militant indigenists in his own country. And he crosses history like a jade comet, now and then giving off flashes of lightning. What is he pursuing in his eccentric course? He wants to go back beyond the catastrophe he suffered. He wants to be a son again, to return to the center of that life from which he was separated one day. Was that day the conquest? independence, our solitude has the same roots as religious feelings. It is a form of orphanhood, an obscure awareness that we have been torn from the all and an ardent search, a flight and a return, an effort to re-establish the bonds that unite us with the universe. End of quotes. Path views the people of the United States as apparently happy, confident, adjusted to the world around them, but also critical of a criticism that is valuable and forthright, but respect existing systems, never touches the roots. For Path in the United States, criticism is of a reformist, not of a revolutionary variety, and there is faith in the natural goodness of life. For Path, attributing, as is commonly done, ingenuity and a realistic attitude to the people of the United States seems contradictory because a person would not continue to be ingenious if he truly contemplated life realistically. And Path questions, quotes, 
Would it not be more accurate to say that the North American wants to use reality rather than to know it? In some matters, death, for example, he not only has no desire to understand it, he obviously avoids the very idea. American realism, then, is of a very special kind, and American ingenuousness does not exclude dissimulation and even hypocrisy. When hypocrisy is a character trait, it also affects one's thinking, because it consists in the negation of all aspects of reality that one finds disagreeable, irrational, or repugnant. In contrast, one of the most notable traits of the Mexican character's character is his willingness to contemplate horror. He is even familiar and complacent in his dealings with it. The bloody Christs in our village churches, the macabre humor in some of our newspapers' headlines, our wakes, the custom of eating skull-shaped cakes and candies on the Day of the Dead, are habits inherited from the Indians and the Spaniards and are now an inseparable part of our being. Our cult of death is also a cult of life, in the same way that love is a hunger for life and a longing for death. Death and life are opposites that complement each other. Pat's uh, references to men when he means people or humans and his address to a male reader betrays his male perspective. Other aspects of his essays indicate that he also writes from a middle-class mestizo perspective. What interests me here now is how he writes about two Mexican females, the, the types of La Llorona and Malinche. In his essay, uh, particularly Malinche, in his essay, Mexican Masks, Path writes that, quotes, the Mexican seems to me uh, to be a person who shuts himself away to protect himself. His face is a mask and so is his smile. A Mexican man cannot open himself up, cannot be weak. This has to do with Mexican history as well, with all the occupations that the country has suffered and how important it was not to voice discontent. No? This has made the Mexican macho hermetic, reserved, stoic. Mexican history, quotes, is full of expressions and incidents that demonstrate the indifference of our heroes towards suffering or danger. There is a predominance of the closed of, over the open. Regarding the woman, in the 50s, uh, in this essay that we bear in mind was written in the 50s, the Mexican conception of a woman is a passive goddess, a beloved one, not given much agency. Quotes, women should be secretive. She should confront the world with an impassive smile. She should be decent in the face of erotic excitements and long suffering in the face of adversity. End of quotes. Understanding that he was writing this in the 50s, um, he also said that the woman was a sort of hieratic calm, a tranquility made up of both hope and contempt. And the man was circling around her, courting her, singing to her. Uh, meanwhile, she remains behind the veil of her modesty and immobility. Uh, he, the author does question this conception, but admits that the myth of the long-suffering Mexican woman exists. The mala mujer also exists and is, in, in contrast, is always active, mobile. The Virgin of Guadalupe, of course, is also uh, another uh, stereotype of the woman and is the maximum symbol of Catholicism in Mexico. Guadalupe is an Indian virgin who appeared to the Indian Juan Diego in a hill devoted to the Indian goddess Tonantzin, our mother, the Aztec goddess of fertility. The fall of the Indian gods during the conquest made Mexicans return to feminine deities, but while the Indian goddesses were goddesses of fecundity, linked to agrarian rights, the Catholic mother is the protector of the unfortunate. In Pat's words, the worshippers do not try to make sure of their harvests, but to find the mother's lap. The virgin is the consolation of the poor, the shield of the weak, the help of the oppressed. In sum, she's the mother of the orphans, end of quotes. In contrast to her, the other type of, of woman, the chingada, is the violated mother, like La Malinche, the traitor, who became the mistress of the conqueror, Hernán Cortés, and helped him destroy the Aztec Empire. The labyrinth of solitude, this, these types described have, have been fruit, very fruitful in other forms of art as well, and the book, the collection of essays, has been very uh, fruitful uh, in its influences. 
In cinema, for instance, there is something that the film scholar Charles Ramirez Berg calls the cinema of solitude, following Pat's idea of solitude. Ramirez Berg devotes two chapters to the images of women. Um, I had chosen a clip from, uh, or two clips from, from two films, but I think we have no time to, to watch them. I, I just describe them um, a little bit and then I, I let the other speakers uh, talk. Um, um, Ramirez Berg uh, calls this, uh, this cinema of solitude, the cinema produced between 16, 1967 and 1983 because, quotes, since the late 1960s, Mexico's sociopolitical center has not held, leaving its citizens isolated and abandoned. In recent Mexican films, this is represented by a parade of characters lost in their solitude. This is how he understands it. Ramirez, while recognizing that this idea of the quest of Mexicanidad might be, quote, an elaborate game played by upper class intellectuals to amuse themselves, to mask more serious problems, and so, end quote, this is an idea by Roger Bartra, maintains that Mexicanidad anyway manifests itself in film and other forms of cultural expression. He points out that the role of women in Mexican society has changed drastically in the years following World War II and uh, has, uh, you know, cinema has served to reevaluate female stereotypes like those of La Malinche, the virgin and the suffering Mexican mother of which Octavio Paz talks about. Some of the um, uh, portrayals of women confront those stereotypes, like the 18, 1983's movie Frida, Naturaleza Viva, by um, uh, Paul Leduc, by the Mexican filmmaker Paul Leduc. And uh, this is a key film because it represents the end point of La Llorona narratives. La Llorona is the weeping woman. Uh, it's a folk legend which seems to be a synthesis of both uh, Aztec and European elements. And according to José Limón, this is a wandering woman who walks at night in search for a lost or murdered child. And um, in, in La Llorona na narratives, usually the women go mad. But uh, according to Ramirez Berg, Frida is, uh, no longer follows that path and is a contestational feminist film whose protagonist uh, does not go mad. And you may have all heard of uh, the famous painter Frida Kahlo, no? a very strong, also embodying uh, Mexicanity in a way, no? a very a symbol of, of Mexicanness, uh, and also of a strong woman who, despite his uh, terrible life and all the accidents that she had, uh, she managed to pursue her goals in, in life and become a, a, an incredible artist, a celebrated artist. Uh, and of course, um, there are people who, this, this has even been more, more fruitful, the Labyrinth of Solitude has even been more fruitful and contested as well. And uh, in recent uh, uh, Mexican cinema, uh, another scholar called Ignacio Sanchez Prado claims that there is no longer an interest in, in Mexicanidad in Mexican cinema. If we look at the films of Cuarón or Guillermo del Toro, etc. There is no longer this idea of the Mexican being uh, affected by this solitude, no? but this would be uh, a topic for another um, talk, perhaps. Well, uh, just to conclude, as you might have noticed, Octavius Paz's uh, prose is clear, easy to read. I, we haven't had time to read it, but uh, I encourage you to really read it because um, even if uh, we feel sometimes a bit frightened by the genre essay, especially nowadays, no? how many people read essays here for pleasure, uh, this is a really very readable uh, essay, no? and it's divided into different essays. Very easy to read, very enlightening, and uh, I don't think, uh, you know, lack of knowledge of Mexican culture would uh, uh, prevent you from understanding and relating to this text, which I, I, I view is still many of the uh, questions in this essay about uh, rationality, about constitutional development, I haven't had the time to develop, still are very relevant for today's uh, readers. So um, I hope you can enjoy the reading of these two texts. And I'm now passing uh, to uh, Ms. Nava. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vasquez, and uh, for your most interesting uh, lecture. And I do hope that this uh, um, can encourage you to, to discover Latin American literature through the, wor for, through these, uh, the works of these two seminal 
uh, writers of Latin America. And uh, as said, the second part of the seminar is uh, dedicated to the poetry collection Desde Hong Kong, Poets in Conversation with Octavio Paz, which, has launched, uh, which was launched at the Octavio Paz Gallery of the Consulate General of Mexico in December 2014. Integrated by original poetry, whose seed can be traced back in the works of uh, and the works and beloved themes of the Mexican Nobel Prize laureate uh, Octavio Paz, this project is an example of trans-Pacific literary inspiration, a showcase of Hong Kong uh, poetic talent, and an example of how community involvement can catalyze literature and other art and cultural expressions. I hereby have the pleasure to introduce the three co-editors of Desde Hong Kong Poets in Conversation with Octavio Paz, Germán Muñoz, Juan José Morales, and Tammy Ho, as well as some of the poets who participated in the book, including co-editor uh, Tammy Ho and David McCurdy, as well as Peter Gordon, director of Chameleon Press, uh, the publishing house of the book, to whom we express our deepest appreciation for his support to this project and presentation. And uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, part of the Hong Kong Poets in Conversation with Octavio Paz, the floor is yours. Please proceed to take your, pl your place in the floor. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for the conference. It was very interesting. And um, I would like to say just that um, uh, going back to the work of uh, Octavio Paz, we prefer to focus on, on poetry. Um, Octavio Paz is one of the most important authors in the Spanish-speaking world. And uh, I'm very happy to, to, to know that uh, it's a source of interest as uh, well as Alejo Carpentier, the Cuban writer. And the uh, other reason to be very pleased today is that um, if you visit the Latin American Pavilion, uh, you will find uh, great uh, works from people like, uh, for instance, uh, Bioy Cáceres from Argentina, or Gabriel García Márquez from Colombia, Álvaro Mutis, etc. So, well, the, this time, um, Juan José, Tammy, we are going to, to read uh, some of the works of uh, Octavio Paz. Um, Octavio Paz is not just uh, a visionary in terms of uh, politics, and creating ideas and leading a, a movement to change many uh, preconcepts that exist in Mexico and in general in the world, but is one of the most excellent poets. Please, uh, Juan Jose, I feel ready to hear you. Thank you very much. Uh, very nice uh, to be here, in order for me to be here. Entre irse y quedarse. Entre irse y quedarse duda el día, enamorado de su transparencia. La tarde circular es ya bahía, en su quieto vaivén se mece el mundo. Todo es visible y todo es elusivo. Todo está cerca y todo es intocable. Los papeles, el libro, el vaso, el lápiz, reposan a la sombra de sus nombres, Latir del tiempo que en mi sien repite la misma terca sílaba de sangre. La luz hace del muro indiferente un espectral teatro de reflejos. En el centro de un ojo me descubro. No me mira, me miro en su mirada. Se disipa el instante. Sin moverme, yo me quedo y me voy. Soy una pausa. I'm going to read the English translation. Um, it's by Peter Gordon, the publisher of um, this collection. Mm -hmm. Between going and staying, between going and staying, the day is stuck, a block of frozen transparency. 
Everything is seen, yet all is elusive. The horizon untouchably near. Papers on the table, a book, a vase. All rest in the shadow of their names. Blood ascends more slowly through my veins. A single syllable beating stubbornly in my temples. The indifferent light transforms opaque walls, time without history. The afternoon has spread out. Now is a bay walking, in, walking the world with its gentle swaying. We are neither asleep nor awake. We are, we just are. The moment, light, the moment lets itself go, we pour ourselves away, pauses in transit. Well, I'm going to read in Spanish, Como que no oye llover. Óyeme como que no oye llover, ni atenta ni distraída, pasos leves, llovizna. Agua que es aire, agua, aire que es tiempo. El día no acaba de irse, la noche llega todavía. Figuraciones de la niebla al doblar la esquina. Figuraciones del tiempo, en el recodo de esta pausa. Óyeme como que no oye llover. Sin oírme, oyendo lo que digo, con los ojos abiertos hacia adentro, dormida con los cinco sentidos despiertos, llueve. Pasos leves, rumor de sílabas, aire y agua, palabras que no pesan. Lo que fuimos y somos los días y los años, este instante, tiempo sin peso, pesadumbre enorme, óyeme como quien oye llover relumbre el asfalto húmedo, el vaho se levanta y camina, la noche se abre y me mira, eres tú y tu talle de vaho, tú y tu cara de noche, tú y tu pelo lento, relámpago, cruzas la calle y entras en mi frente, pasos de agua sobre mis párpados, óyeme como quien oye llover, el asfalto relumbra, Tú cruzas la calle, es la niebla errante en la noche, es la noche dormida en tu cama, es el, es el oleaje de tu respiración. Tus dedos de agua mojan mi frente, tus dedos de llama queman mis ojos. Tus dedos de aire abren los párpados del tiempo, manar de apariciones y resurrecciones. Óyeme como quien oye llover. Again, I'm going to read the English translation by Peter Gordon. Hear the wing. Hear me as you hear the wing. In the back of your mind, Peter Patter drizzling. Water that is air. Air that is time. The days not yet gone. Evenings yet to come. Figures in the mist. Just around the corner. Figures of time. At the bend in this moment, hear me as you hear the wing. Without hearing, but hearing what I say, with eyes open to what's within, asleep with the senses awake. It's raining, Peter patter, a murmur of syllables, air and water, weightless words of what we were and are. The days and years, this moment, time without weight, enormous burden, hear me as you hear the wing. The wet tarmac shining, the mist rises and walks, the night opens and watches me. It's you wrapped in mist, you and your face of night, you and your skin faintly flashing, crossing the street, entering by my temples, watery paces on my eyelids. Hear me as you hear the wing. The tarmac glistens, you cross the street, is the wandering fog in the night, is the night asleep in your bed? Is the ocean swell of your breathing? Your watery fingers wet my brow. Your fiery fingers burn my eyes. Your airy fingers open the eyelids of time.
gushing forth apparitions and resurrections. Hear me as you hear the rain. The years pass, the moments return. Can you hear your steps next door? Neither here nor there. You hear them in another time that is right now. Hear the steps of time, creator of, creator of places with their mass or location. Hear the rain running down the terrace. The night is already darker in the corpse. The waves have bedded down among the leaves, a rambling garden adrift. Come, your shadow covers this page. Thank you, Tammy. Um, it's a great pleasure to be involved in this uh, uh, cross-cultural event between uh, Latin America and Hong Kong. And I'd like to take the opportunity to invite some of our Hong Kong poets who contributed to Des Day Hong Kong to come and uh, read their contribution. I'd like to first ask uh, Albert Lee, who's uh, a stalwart of our local poetry scene. Please give a big hand to Albert. <laughs> Ginger flower field. Crows descend in formation on telephone lines that drape across the evening sky. In ginger flower fields, they dug and they found pig bones, chicken bones, and human bones. Ginger flowers wreathed in the simmering heat. In the dark, they glow. Strewn across a shady patch were remains of smothered uniforms, of party lines and news lines from heaven, clan and bloodlines from below. Wild, wild ginger flowers, they spread fast after the summer rain. On the bones, they found no tattoo. Some bones managed to miss the graveyard, the last stand of human boundaries. The scent of ginger flowers is unmistakable, especially in a hot, musty night. It bodes well with the markings on the cemented tomes. These evoke memories. Waiting for the advent of a new line to tag along that meandering path, path that leads to nowhere, the crows ascend slowly into the night sky. Thank you, Albert. Uh, next, I'd like to ask Douglas Robinson to come up and uh, read his uh, contribution. Thank you, David. <clears throat> this is called The Translated Word. The word telekinetic floating up off the translated page, echoing glossolalic through HKG's international gates, 400 souls knuckled white into the paging of delayed flight CX 850 to Mexico City, topping the tarmac to walk that tight wire tensed from the silenced cry to the corporate cool of the in-flight magazine in three languages. Quote, to speak a foreign tongue and understand it and translate it into one's own is to restore the unity of the beginning, end quote, wrote Octavio Paz. That beginning, blanco como el anima, that rises off the page like echolalia, that compulsion to translate that inclined Paz to think, quote, that we are once more in the presence of a human constant, end quote. Bare beginning, bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim ve'et haaretz. When the earth was without form and empty, that gormlessness of the unity that, as Paz hoped, translation had already restored. The bareness before the Elohim, those impetuous Palestinian gods, went and created one language, but then scattered our speech, Sabcha. Dispersed, Wayapes, us like tourists to 1,000 airports, lest we build an Airbus big enough and with a metaphysical fuel capacity to fly us all to the gates of heaven and so become like the Elohim ourselves, themselves. 
innocence in no sense other than wanting the words to miss our flight. Thank you very much. Next we'll have uh, Paige Richards, who's another one of our uh, longtime poets here in Hong Kong. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, just a brief word. I grew up in America with my, mo with my father reading from the English canon, John Donne, Matthew Arnold, Wallace Stevens. My mother liked to read in translation. She'd read Yehuma, Yehuda Amakai and Victor Hugo and Octavia Paz. And, uh, I remember when she'd read him to me, she would talk about how much she liked the quiet that he had. And for me, listening to him then, there was something about those inseparable things that had nearness and that audible silence. So in the spirit of my mother, who's died recently, and especially in the spirit of Octavio Paz tonight, I read something on that audible silence. Um, I mean, I'll, just, I'll just project. Actually, I teach a lot, so that's all right. I'll just project. Oh, that's okay. Thank you. I'm, I was just teaching for 300 students earlier today, so if you can't hear me. Pilgrimage. A mysterious voice heard me in the middle of my years, took me to water, which ran back down so I could follow. What do you want? It asked. And I, the youngest in my family, without shoes, I never liked to give up, wanted to get on my knees in water, peel off my life, bring them all back, bring back my father, my mother back to me, all I counted on. I counted on them. I said, what a false lion, not far off, sat on a hill and looked left for no reason other than scent or sound or something he could tell inside his body. I crawled up to the mysterious voice and asked to be let in. Let into what, the voice asked. Into something, I said. You talk the whole time, he said. I know, I said, as if my voice could do something. Thank you. It seems I found my true vocation. <laughs> um, as I see no other uh, readers here apart from myself, and Tammy doesn't want to read hers, then I'll, uh, I'll read my own contribution. Um, I grew up in Hong Kong, and when I was a little boy, there were uh, scribes in the street who would write letters for many of the refugees in Hong Kong who were illiterate to their family back in China. And this was the only way that they were able to communicate with each other. And so uh, the piece that I put in is about these street scribes, and uh, they were the great communicators of Asia, of Hong Kong, as Octavio Paz was a great communicator. Writing history. Chinese gentlemen in traditional robes inhabit the streets of my youth. Scribes with folding tables and chairs, inkstone and brushes, gaunt classical scholars performing exquisite calligraphy for utility. In the service of illiterate laborers, the highest expression of the literary arts reduced to mere communication. Letters home to be read and narrated by others in other streets in other cities. Part fortune teller, psychologist, agony uncle. Bad news censored, rendered palatable with subtlety and nuance. Good tidings enhanced. In another place, another time, they would be magistrates, court officials, rather than abroad in significance, at the sharp end of the historical narrative, the collective amanuensis of a country in chaos. Um, thank you very much. Now we still have time for a question and answer session for uh, Mercedes Vasquez, her fascinating uh, talk that she gave earlier, and we want to stop now to give ample time for all of you to be able to ask your questions. Uh, Mercedes, just, uh, would you like to come back? Just, Sorry, just okay. one, one uh, brief comment. This is possible, this event, and the presence of Latin American literature 
in this uh, fair, thanks to the effort of many people, the Mexican consulate, the Argentinian consulate, the Peruvian consulate. It's a sample of uh, collaboration of uh, many people that uh, are making possible all this. And uh, I hope that this could be the first time and not the last one. Mercedes. In case any of you are wondering, the different sizes of the names is according to the height. Yes, it would be perfect if you all the, the speakers remain on uh, on the stage, and uh, we can open now the the question and answer session. Uh, so please, gentlemen, you have, ladies and gentlemen, you have the floor. In case there's any any question. Uh, first of all, well, I would like to open that uh, uh, with the. Well, first of all, I would like to 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 thank all of you for bringing such a wonderful perspective for uh, Latin American perspective uh, literature, and uh, well, the project of the Desde Hong Kong uh, uh, poets in conversation with uh, Octavio Paz, which is a wonderful example of uh, of how literature can uh, unite uh, uh, people who are actually not so. Not so far away, even despite of the of the distance. And uh, uh, well, my my question will be if uh, for the editors, if you can elaborate a little bit more on the on the story, how it uh, is, uh, th this project started, what was the seed of it, and uh, well, since uh, it's been already uh, more than six months since we launched it uh, officially, what has been the the reaction of this uh, of this work uh, so far? Uh, if you can tell us a little bit about it, please. Thank you. I would like to invite uh, yes. Peter Gordon uh, to, to tell us about that uh, story. <laughs> I, was, I was hoping to avoid this. Um, the story is that, uh, I guess quite some time, it's been almost a year ago. Um, uh, Juan Jose Morales said, I have a friend I want you to meet, and we all went to lunch with Herman. <clears throat> and Herman said, this year is Octavio Paz's centenary, and I'm the president of the Mexican Chamber of Commerce, and I think we should do something. And I said, like what? He said, oh, bring someone from Mexico. I said, it's very expensive. And he said, well, maybe we can do a lecture. I said, okay, it's hard to get people to come. And we thought about it, and, and I think sort of three or four glasses of wine into the lunch. I said, you know, we can do a book, because I know how to do books. And there are a lot of very good poets in Hong Kong. And um, I think if we were to invite them to write poems in commemoration of Octavio Paz, I'm talking to Octavio Paz, we would get many things. There would, we'd have a book, which is a pretty good commemoration, I think, of a poet. And it would also be a community project, something where people would be talking to each other, talking metaphorically anyway, to Octavio Paz. Um, and uh, everyone said, that sounds like a good idea. Uh, then we invited Tammy to join us. Tammy, as you may know, runs um, one of the literary journals here and knows everybody and was the one that very much brought it all together and made it happen. Uh, and also through her, the poets we involved expanded out beyond Hong Kong to include poets from Singapore and the Philippines and India, and in fact, uh, into the United States and some other countries as well. And that's what we ended up with, and that's really the story of how it happened. Very good. So, a good community project, it was a good thing to do. You know, a lot of people working together, um, which is really the way you have to do things here. Everybody fell in love with the idea to work about Octavio Yes. And uh, I am very happy that Mercedes Vázquez is today here. And uh, today, uh, perhaps, is uh, well, the first uh, uh, contact with Octavio Paz, but some of you, or for many of you, there are very many aspects of Octavio Paz uh, that need to be known. He's one of the towering figures of the Spanish letters, but he's uh, one of the great intellectuals of the 20th century. One of the most important act aspects, or actually what brought me uh, very many years uh, afterwards to Octavio Paz again, 
were his translations of Chinese classical poetry. Poets of the Tang Dynasty and of the Sound Dynasty, the, his translation of the uh, Chao Chu, and the classic Taoist. And well, it's actually, uh, it was um, my uh, work on these translations and the translations into English and into French that uh, Octavio Paz used, and I researched on, on those poems that brought me also in contact with Mercedes, and Mercedes uh, gave me the chance uh, in Hong Kong University to give a talk to his students on these translations of Chinese classical poetry. So uh, this several years ago, thank you very much, Mercedes. And, thank you to you. <laughs> and there are, uh, well, an, another aspect that I invite uh, you to read. I consider uh, those translations perhaps uh, the most loyal to the word and to the spirit of these uh, Tan poets. Uh, it was a, a work of many years and in contact also with the best sinologists, uh, uh, especially in Tan uh, poets. Also, Octavio Paz was a friend of Bart Barton Watson, so one of the best poet uh, translators into English of Chinese poetry. Uh, and in India as well. So thank you very much. And, and, and the poems, may I just add, the poems actually, the translated poems, uh, work as Spanish poems too. It's amazing. Eh? We were looking in one of our lectures and it's incredible. He was incredible as a translator as well. Besides being a great diplomat as well. Exactly, uh, yeah, in Asia as well, right? In India as well. Yeah, in India, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. I, I actually had a question for you. <laughs> Maybe later. <laughs> um, I have a question, uh, maybe for everyone on the panel. It's, uh, I read a book um, a while ago, quite a while ago, uh, written by the French uh, science fiction writer, uh, Jules Verne. Jules Verne. And the, the name of the book is the Paris in the 20th century. And he sort of predicted uh, the end of poetry and, and literature uh, uh, by the 20th century, and and I can see the kind of pressure. Uh, I mean, if you visit universities and workplaces, uh, the little emphasis uh, we have uh, on literature in general. Um, how, how do you see the future uh, of literature and, and perhaps poetry uh, in post-colonial places? Sorry. <laughs> um, okay, I'd like to say something about that. I think that. Uh, Poetry and literature doesn't belong just to academia. And uh, there are people doing it who uh, perhaps don't have very uh, high academic qualifications, but they're doing it because they love it. I think particularly in poetry, uh, in Hong Kong, we have quite a, a vibrant scene and uh, there are plenty of young people who, who come and, and read poetry. So um, it seems to be alive. And I think that even if, uh, if one looks at contemporary music and rap and this sort of thing, it's not my favorite type of music, but I think it does carry on uh, the legacy of, of uh, poetic endeavor. Well, as, as a teacher, I, I teach mostly language, but I also teach literature and cinema. I am uh, quite worried about the developments of um, uh, the importance given to literature in general and uh, sometimes even to humanities. Hmm? But uh, what literature is for me, I mean, it's a need. It's not, it's not just a pleasure. I need literature to live a richer life. And this is a need that I don't think is just mine. Uh, there are many different uses, possible uses of literature, right? But there is one that you need literature. It's not uh, to understand better, to have a richer life, etc. And I don't think, uh, in this case, literature can disappear. Poetry or, you know, being one of the maximum expressions of the human uh, species, you know, the, the greatest expressions of the human species. Can we really, is it going to really disappear? Can we really destroy it? It, probably not. It's indestructible because we need it. So, uh, you know, try to destroy it. 
Well, if uh, may I add something, I could say that in, in general in Latin America, Latin America with all this scenario, uh, sometimes very conflictive, um, there's um, a fertile ground for uh, literature in general, for plastic arts, and um, you can see societies in economic crisis like uh, Argentina. Buenos Aires is one of the most vibrant uh, centers of culture in Latin America, with more, uh, probably more uh, libraries than um, other countries, the world country, considering the world country. And Mexico still is um, a source of inspiration, not just for Mexican artists, for Mexican writers, but for people coming from all around the world. And um, it's something that, uh, when you were talking about um, Alejo Carpentier, uh, I was thinking in the Realismo Magico, the magical realism that is a creation of uh, Alejo Carpentier, and um, in Mexico, it's something that is in our veins when we say that uh, the surrealistic movement is not just uh, an expression of a cultural trending or whatever, it's part of our lives, <laughs> you know? And um, we, we play with that, and uh, I think it is a source of creativity and inspiration for Mexicans, for Argentinians, Peruvians, Colombians, people from all the continent. So I think that it's long life for poetry, long life for literature. Thank you very much. If uh, there is no other further questions, I would like to, uh, well, to finish this session by thanking again all wonderful speakers tonight, all the, uh, the contributors to the, the poetry um, uh, compilation. Thank you so much for, for your presence here.